No further discussion. So uh, you're not in favor. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So motion carries. So we are not going to be able to add this at this time. This evening we come for the adoption of the uh, annual report, the presentation of the annual report by City Code, the city managers are to prepare a report that verifies and gives an overview of the various accomplishments of the city government in the previous year. While the report always comes over my name, it is not my report. It's the report of your department heads, your division directors. It's the report of 550 employees. They are the ones who provide the service. In this meeting this evening and in subsequent meetings, you will hear from department directors about their accomplishments and also their challenges. You will hear about the fact that Carmen Miracle was selected as clerk of the year by her <laughs> clerks association. You will hear about the military community census report that Glenn and others have led the effort to change the federal register. You'll hear about purchasing improvements that finances have made that are part of your three E's program of efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. About the health plan changes that many people, including the HR people and you, have worked on. You'll also hear about the work of police and fire, especially in the use of Narcan as they have really utilized that to save lives relative to drug overdoses. You will hear about the Beirut Memorial Grove and the work that Michael and his folks in Parks did to create that new monument. And you will hear about the Office of Livable Neighborhoods. And yes, you will hear about the splash pad. Tonight, though, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes relative to my goals for the coming year in the city manager's office. <coughs> Here are the seven goals that I put in the overview. The first goal is to identify programs and opportunities to continue with the mayor and council's three E's programs of efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. We are going to continue to face more and more stringent budgets. Each of you in our budget deliberations has pointed out the challenges that we face as a growing community. We are going to grow. We are going to primarily grow, though, from a tax base based upon commercial. The years of annexation are years that are no longer with us. The years of residential development have slowed. And therefore, it is essential that in all that we do, we look for ways to become more efficient, more effective, and more economical. The second goal for the coming year is to work to establish programs designed to continue the Caring Community Initiative of Jacksonville. Caring Community has been part of the motto of the city of Jacksonville much longer than I've been here. We have to make sure, though, that it doesn't become just a stale tagline. We see nationwide the challenges that our country are facing of people getting along. While we certainly have been fortunate that we have not faced some of the challenges that some cities have faced, we have to make sure that we're proactive, that we find ways to show that we truly are caring, and that we go out of our way to make sure that we are good host to the military families and military personnel who serve here. The third goal is to refine marketing and recruitment efforts to enlarge our pool of diverse candidates. I'm very pleased to tell you that about a week ago, I had the opportunity to meet seven new firefighters. Two of those were African American, one is Hispanic. The others were what I would call white Americans. They're all Americans. We have to make sure though that the efforts we're putting in place are attracting a diverse workforce and that that, diverse work, that that diverse workforce is given an opportunity for long-term employment here. The next goal is career development programs to promote training and skill development of our current employee base. Many times you are going to hear tonight about programs that HR and others are doing to develop the skill set within their own employment, in, in their own employment ranks. It is essential 
that we as an organization constantly give opportunities for employees to advance their skills and likewise advance their opportunities. The next goal is general efforts to continue to beautify the city. Many of you have noticed that on Huff Drive, there's dirt in place of grass. Well, the good news is the grass was there, the dirt is there, and very shortly, you're going to start seeing understory plants and very nice crepe myrtles and very nice landscaping. And then over the next several weeks, you're going to see that expand all the way up Jacksonville Parkway. The leadership which you have given to beautify the city has been noticed by many people, including your own employees. I had an employee stop the other day and just say to me how beautiful the Freedom Fountain, the Flag Garden, the area coming into downtown is. You should be proud of that. We as an organization should be proud of that. But we need to make sure that in the coming budget and in the coming year, that if we can squeeze out an extra 5,000, an extra 25,000 to put a few more trees, a few more landscaping, that we do that. You may also have noticed that directly across the street from City Hall that we have now put in the first of our pedestrian bulb outs. It's over in front of the uh, parts store and it improves safety. That is part of our beginning of some experiments. We would hope you and the public would weigh in because if you like that, then over the next several months, we're going to take very limited resources and use city employees to install more and more of those bulb outs so that these four blocks here can be beautified. The sixth goal is cooperation with the new county leadership and elected county officials. Three weeks from now, there will be many ballots cast, and the result of that will be not only national, state, but also county implications. Part of my job as the manager is to make sure that we develop excellent relationships with the administrative staff. And obviously part of your job is to develop excellent relationships with the new elected officials. And that is going to be a team effort. We have, the CMO leadership group has talked about hosting some meetings between the city council and the newly elected commission. So we're hoping that in January, early February at the latest, we'll be able to have a meeting, a joint session, between the City Council and the new County Commission. And the last goal is to prepare a balanced budget. Every year, that is where we start the budgeting process, is on the basis that we have to live within our resources. There are no guarantees, because at this point we haven't seen the expenditures. What we do know is that the first quarter reports are very close to coming in. Gail is not letting me spend any money, so that's a good step in the right direction. But again, we are going to all be faced with a balanced budget effort. I would welcome the opportunity over the next several weeks for you to also identify goals that you'd like the city manager's office to address. In the coming weeks, I know that the city council will be having an evaluation session of myself as city manager and the handsome and talented barrister, Mr. Carter. I would certainly welcome the opportunity in that session, before or after that session, to receive input about directions you want your city government to take beyond these that I've identified. At this time, I'd like to get into the actual department reports. As you will recall, we have, the organization is so large now that we really have broken it into two groups. Last year, you heard primarily from utilities and IT. This year, you're primarily going to hear from the general fund departments. And with this, I'd like to turn this seat over to Carmen Miracle, the clerk of the year, and ask her to come and give her report. Can you just sit here with me? I'm well, I'm going to let here. you sit closest okay. to him. Right. And by the way, she had her twin grandsons in town this weekend, <laughs> so she's in a great mood. <laughs> I forget how to use this, so you may have to transfer it for me. Uh, you're asking well, me to use technology. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about the City Clerk's Office. Uh, as you can see here, um, our primary mission is customer service. 
um, and to uh, fulfill the duties uh, outlined by the North Carolina General Statutes and those that are signed by the city manager. One of our key functions is to make sure that the city is in compliance with the public records law. We also manage um, all of the council's official documents, um, such as the minutes, the resolutions, ordinances, deeds, the city code, those types of things. Uh, we also um, work with the council on scheduling your personal appearances and preparing proclamations and special awards. We provide support to the city manager's office and we assist the city attorney with some research and with some statutory requirements such as street closings, voluntary annexations, sale of city property, etc. Uh, we also uh, work closely with the management team and the department directors to prepare and organize your council agenda and to plan your council meetings and to ensure that the city uh, is in compliance with the open meetings law. We provide data management for uh, all of your advisory committee meetings. Uh, this includes um, the application process and appointments, reappointments. Um, we also provide for them an orientation meeting for new members. Uh, we've also been um, uh, able to work on the joint city council and advisory committee summits each year, and we coordinate and plan the committee volunteer appreciation dinner. Uh, for the uh, for since its inception, the clerk's office has uh, pr uh, been providing uh, clerk to the board services to the Tourism and Development Authority. Uh, previously, my deputy clerk uh, performed those duties, and now I myself am performing those duties. The last time we talked about the city cemetery, which is a subject close to my heart, um, we <sighs> we talked about the generosity of um, Mrs. Sarakovich, who bequeathed her estate to the city with the stipulation that the proceeds were to be used for improvements at the city cemetery. Um, since that time, um, we have worked together, um, uh, the city manager, um, myself, the um, executor to the estate, uh, Mrs. Waters, and mostly the city attorney and uh, Deanna Treble, who is with our engineering department, uh, led the effort uh, to, and as you can see in these pictures, and if you've been by there lately, you see that some work is going on, the installation of the uh, pillars, the brick pillars for the entrance and exit gates have been installed, and portions of the fence have been installed with more to come. Um, as council knows, the former Mayor's Committee for Persons with Disabilities has transitioned into a standalone 501c3 agency, the Onsu Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, yet we still work with them on a project the city started many, many, many years ago, the Poster Poetry and Essay Contest, which is provided to all school-age children from kindergarten through 12th grade. And we also plan um, and execute the um, a project that is uh, close to my heart and um, also very important to the city and to you, and that's the annual Veterans Recognition Ceremony, which is coming up here shortly next month. Okay. Um, we're very excited about a project that we're um, going to work on in the coming year, which is a citywide records management program. Um, we currently follow the state's retention and disposition schedule, but we don't have a uh, records, a uniform records plan that addresses how we manage records on a day-to-day -day basis, in particular uh, electronic records such as social media, text messages, and those types of things. So that's something we'll be working on, not just myself, but with a team from all of the departments. And lastly, I just want to briefly um, speak about the changes in the CMO office and the clerk's office. As most of you know, the city manager's longtime executive assistant uh, retired this past July. And that allowed the management team an opportunity to think about how we might structure the office to um, meet the council's philosophy of the three E's, efficiency, economy, effectiveness. And uh, with that in mind, um, the 
uh, administrative staff have been assigned to me and um, we feel like this uh, restructure under one supervisor uh, will allow us to work more effectively as a more cohesive team. It will allow for cross-training uh, between the two departments, and we think it will provide for a more even distribution of the workload. That's all I have, Council. I'm not going to talk about Clerk of the Year other than to thank you for allowing me to participate in the Clerks Association and which allowed me to earn that award. Congratulations. Congratulations. Questions or thoughts about the clerk's activities? How far are we are, are we from completing the cemetery? Yes. I would guess that we're about 50% of the way. It the looks really good what's been yeah. done so far. Very good. We're going to have to make some adjustments because some of the, um, uh, for lack of a better term, some of the variations in height that are currently being caused by the topography we need to address. The area along Hargett Street is probably 80% installed, and then we will begin the area along 24. The corner feature, which will actually have the name Jacksonville City Cemetery, uh, is currently being uh, sculptured because that will actually be a piece of granite, granite. Yes, sir. Okay. that will have that um, sandblasted in. So there's still the corner piece uh, that will go in. But as Carmen said, uh, Ms. Kovich and her estate made that possible. And once completed, we will have a very appropriate ceremony with you all invited. We have some plans for a commemorative plaque for the bequeathies. Is that <laughs> generosity? The answer is yes. Our thought is to <clears throat> possibly build a reflection garden and actually call it the Kovich Reflection Garden. And we've identified uh, two potential sites, both of which are relatively close to where she and her husband are buried. So that will also be one of the last parts of what we'll do there. Very good. How are you on your fulfilling the previous city clerk's goal of filling up all the cemetery costs? <laughs> Well, they've, they've all been sold, but we haven't filled them all up yet. Okay. You own one yourself, <laughs> so we don't want to fill it up anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and just for the Even record. Even though your views may not be shared, you know. <laughs> and just for the record, uh, we do not have a sign that flashes no vacancy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Glenn, community, communications and community affairs. Thank you. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, indeed, um, our unit um, has um, dual purposes combined into one person, and um, the four media specialists as we are there. And of course, it is to really, at the end of the day, tell the story of the city of Jacksonville and through community programs and community affairs to help improve the city. And we facilitate transparency that you wish by the actions that we take to tell your story and to continue that going as it is. Um, in an overview, um, that informing the public is part of a large thing that we do and through social media, through the website, and through um, all the other activities that we do is to tell them what is the city. We help to advance the brand to make sure that people, when they see something, know that it's from the city of Jacksonville and that it has a city of Jacksonville flavor to it. And obviously through community affairs to tell that story in a way that it mixed in with the, with the narrative that we're doing for all the activities that the city of Jacksonville supports. Among those things is that we tell that story annually when we have the Chamber Leadership Day tour and tell them why those memorials are there and how this community came together. Um, the mayor will be doing a much more elaborate description of that when he addresses the Beirut Memorial Observance um, on October 23rd at 2 o'clock. And, of course, one of the things that we were proud of as our accomplishment was helping to um, organize both the 4th Marine Division final muster and the 75th um, anniversary of the 2nd Marine Division, um, the latter of which produced that record-setting parade on um, downtown Jacksonville and the former causing an emotional appeal, seeing those people who had fought in the Battle of Iwo Jima um, meet for the last time and to choose to do so aboard Camp Lejeune was an awe-inspiring moment as it was. Um, for the Tourism and Development Authority, um, we oversaw the um, Sports Destination Study and its final report and um, the completion of the first phase of a strategic plan for telling the story of Jacksonville and why you should come and visit here. 
Um, as the manager mentioned, um, one thing that we're happy about is how that um, our message about that there needed to be a change in the census rule about residency of of our military members who happen to be deployed on the day of the census. Um, um, at this moment, we uh, look as though we have prevailed, and that that will go forward in the way that it wishes that we wish to see it go. Um, we also um, help with the Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee, the Beirut Memorial Advisory Board, the Civic Affairs Committee for the county, and we provide um, the logistic support for your meetings and some uh, in council meetings such as that. Um, the G10 operations are part of what Media Services um, does daily. Um, there are 225 events in the last fiscal year that, um, that we covered, including your meetings and other meetings and uh, the special events that take place. Um, as mentioned, we also operate your website, um, which we'll be doing a, um, in the next year, we'll be doing a, a redesign. Every four years, we're, we're part of a redesign of that. And uh, the surprise part of our life has been the print pieces. We didn't expect to still be doing as many print pieces as we are, but the demand for print pieces is extraordinarily high, and it does facilitate the um, advancing of our brand and the pieces that we put out. And of course, we get involved in many special projects. Um, among the things that you might be interested in is there were 435 unique visitors to your web pages. Now, oh, say that again. 435,000 unique visitors to your web page, and that um, most of, many of them were looking for employment, um, but the next highest number of them were looking for utility billing. You know how to pay their bill and do things, which of course we want to help facilitate as much as possible. Um, we have 32,000 likes on your Facebook page for the City of Jacksonville government. We actually operate seven different pages um, for the city. Um, the top um, number of likes <laughs> was the alligator story, which is no real surprise that it went that far. But, um, you know, the fact that uh, we walked in that day past the alligator until a woman that was just out exercising found it was, you know, an amazing thing. But. 83,000, you know, shares, likes, and views of the 2nd Marine Division Parade, and more than 25,000 for the splash pad. And these are the folks that help you tell the story about what it is that you do, and to do that every day. Um, our goals and objectives for this year are to continue telling that story and continue with our branding of the city and its destination as a place to come and stay overnight. And of course, to, um, to now that the Tourism Development Authority has set aside in their budget an amount for wayfinding to advance that project as it is. So we stand ready to serve you folks. Questions? <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question in regards to social media, Glenn, on our side, and then about billing. Um, do you handle, or who handles the actual social media portion, the Facebook and the Twitter? Is it internal, or do yes, we use someone it is internal. external? Yes, okay. Oh, no, we do that internally. And my question, a leading question to that, is that efficient? Is, do you find that... I know that with the league and, and several others, we've changed that because we were finding that there was gaps Yep. and those gaps would lead to sort of inefficiency. Though. So if you're going to be in it, you've got to sort of be in it. Um, you're right. We, um, in, in the after action report for the most recent um, storm, um, it is our opinion that Facebook has almost become the equivalent of what used to be the Citizens Phone Bank. We responded to a lot of people in the middle of the night who had questions and things, and we were able to do that. We had a shift system, so we were all working mostly from our homes and doing so um, to answer and make sure those questions got answered. So we think it's um, very efficient for us to operate it because we have the answers, we can get them quickly. Um, chiefs, people were, Chief Yanaris people were efficient at providing us with hourly updates that you also got, and we were able to share them with the public as they came in and so that people could know what they're doing. Do you get a lot from Twitter also? We don't get as much from Twitter. Um, um, perhaps that's a demographic issue, as it much as it be the following government, but we do tweet regularly and um, answer those um, messages that we get through DMs and things such as that. Well, I thought that <clears throat> I thought the videos you guys did, particularly the chief and several others that went out during that storm were really, really good. So kudos on that. Well, we, we know how the uh, matrix can be affected by use of video and a picture rather than just plain text, and so we, we want to try to play that as much as we can. And the other question was with billing, uh, utility billing, is will there, were, will there be a time where people can do reoccurring Come on, I'm, that's a finance question. Because <laughs> I know that that's, 
Yes. It's doing very well, but I, I know there's still some yes. areas that we can improve in that area to make it easier for people to pay that way. Chair, you can set it up. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that the, the, it's not friendly facing. We are working on a replacement that okay. we have to be more friendly. At one time I was concerned about the amount of money we spend on media operations and getting G10 started, but I've come to be a strong believer, along with many others, that this city, for its size, and probably even size doesn't matter, we probably provide a more open look at what's going on in City Hall than any other comparable or larger city. And uh, I get many comments about people who watch G10, about the council proceedings, and it's one of the best investments we've made in terms of opening up the doors of City Hall. So I congratulate you and your staff for keeping that alive and well done. Well, we simply act on your will. You folks had to make that decision, and we simply are fulfilling that. I guess, there's, is there any way to know uh, an approximate size of your viewing population? The grocery right? store test is the only test. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I would, I would make the comment again. Because of the directions and specific uh, goals that you have set regarding transparency, you'll recall that the advisory boards now all meet in City Hall and their meetings are broadcast live. I mean, we have done everything that we can in the way of advisory boards, whether it's TDA, whether it's MPO, whether it's the uh, you know, sewer advisory committee. Uh, every one of our committee members uh, understand that they have a responsibility to do their business in the public, in front of the public, on TV. And that's the goal y'all set. As Glenn said, that's the goal that we've accomplished. I get a lot of positive comments about, you know, from people that do view the broadcast. And, uh, there, there is a big, a big slice of population out there that are regular. <laughs> I will admit to you, I'm always viewers. amazed. <laughs> I'm always amazed. If no other questions, uh, finance, fleet, and metering. Gail, you and Ed. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Y'all know how much I like to talk, so just settle in and, and we'll be here a few minutes, okay? <laughs> I asked him could I do one slide that said no, the end, that's the story, but... I got a big no myself that time. For finance, fleet, and metering, there are several divisions. We have administration and reporting division, um, accounting, billing and collections, which includes metering, and then fleet. We have 40 total budgeted positions in finance. Um, the administration division, we handle things such as the comprehensive annual report and the audit which you all will be seeing very soon. We do capital asset tracking and depreciation budget, and we assist with the CIP on the financial side. Um, we handle investments, debt management, and there are six positions in this area. In accounting, they're responsible for contracts and purchasing, grants and payroll, and um, in this area, we have nine budget positions. For utility collections, utility billing collections and metering, we do all the billing for the city, including utility bills and any miscellaneous billings. Um, metering reads the meters to produce the bills. They provide um, maintenance to the meters, uh, shut off, shut on, um, reconnects, and all the maintenance activities. Um, in the customer service and collections areas, um, I thought one of the interesting facts was we collected $281,000 under the debt set off program over the last, I think, about <coughs> nine years. That's, we report them to the state, and if they're due a refund of any kind, or if they win the lottery, we get their money if they owe it to us. To me, that's, that's fun. There's <laughs> a lot of money sitting out there, though. To, to be there is a lot, yes. Yes. 
Um, and in this area, there are 14 budget positions. And before she leaves that slide, I took the opportunity to take the number of customers and the number of, uh, of uh, bills between the meter reading and the utility. That was 229,000 business transactions. 229,000. We're not a small operation. And through that, you collect roughly $40 million in, uh, in revenue. For finance and metering, our accomplishments this year, the big one for me was being able to refinance the revenue bonds, the 2009 and 10 revenue bonds. Um, we had a net present value savings of almost $2.6 million. The actual cash value was about 3.1 over the next 15, 16 years. So um, we, were, we were excited about that. Yes, that's right. <laughs> um, yes. We received the Excellence in Financial Reporting Award for the 25th year. Um, we just keep it up from the folks who went before us and set up something for us to follow, but I would hate to be the first one that didn't get <laughs> the award. Um, we've continued our purchasing improvements. I don't know if, if you all remember, we started with the police department. Um, they had a position that they decided to transfer to finance and we're doing um purchasing some centralized purchasing for all of public safety and um we had another opportunity the beginning of this past fiscal year with a vacancy to add another procurement specialist who's now helping it and some of the other divisions that didn't have um admin support um and for metering their maintenance program has made it possible to read about 99% of our meters remotely so they don't have to walk and read those manually. And for FY17, of course our goal is always excellent customer service to the customers. I think that our uh, customer service representatives do a great job of that. I could not stand at that counter and listen to the people who are upset when they come in but I think they do a great job. Um, we want to maintain compliance with all regula regulatory requirements, maintain our system of internal control and look for opportunities to improve that, maybe continue our purchasing improvements. Um, we have begun a project to look at the purchasing policy, but that's a big undertaking. Um, and then I didn't put on here, but the meter readers are going through a training program to become certified in backflow prevention. So um, they are also doing that. And then for fleet, they provide preventative maintenance, like oil change, tire rotations, that kind of thing, and repair services for electronics, hydraulics, anything else that comes through the door that needs to be fixed inventory management and interdepartmental billing to all the departments. There are 11 budgeted positions in fleet. And just for a sidebar, uh, this past uh, several weeks we had the annual uh, the annual auction and Ed, what was your results? Uh, the original estimate of the value of the thing was $150,000. When we finally got everything sold, the city made $184,000. So we had some good stuff out there, uh, larger stuff than we normally do. I uh, had some heavy equipment, larger trucks, and they sold really, really well. So we did good. So in addition to Ed's used equipment lot, <laughs> <laughs> this year they installed a new 12,000 gallon diesel tank, which improved our efficiency a little bit. I think we talked about this in the budget that we couldn't take a full tanker load of uh, diesel fuel sometimes and we were having to buy locally, which costs a little more. And I, th I think Ed would agree this has been a great asset. To it has been. In, in this last storm, uh, uh, lines maintenance and uh, water supply, they bought the trucks with the fuel tank in the back. They came down, filled up from our site to keep all the generators filled up so there wasn't that going out and buy something, pay it so much per drop. So, and we were never in any danger of running low. So that, that bigger tank really, really came into its own just for this hurricane. 
And also in this past year, they were able to maintain their ASC certification. I don't know if you remember, but when they first got certified, they were one of like three or four municipal garages in the state of North Carolina, two of which were Mecklenburg County, who were ASC certified. So they've maintained that. There's a few more now, but still not not a bunch. <clears throat> so I'm proud of Ed and them for keeping the certification. Good pick. Um, and this year they also increased the percentage of hours they were able to build to the apartments and they increased their preventative maintenance completions within their schedule. And for the next year, safety is always goal number one for fleet. Um, they actually have finished installing the new pumps. Um, Ed, you want to tell them about the new? Uh, the original system that was put in when the building was opened in 2005 was a suction type system. So under each one of the dispensers had a separate electric motor that drew the fuel from the tank. That was an inefficient way to do it. We've just upgraded now the submersible pumps in the tanks. And these are just true dispensers right now. We moved from a mechanical dispenser to a digital um, and the dispensers we put in are actually dual dispensers for both sides. The last part of the fuel upgrade will happen probably next fiscal year to upgrade the software. Our current software can only handle four fueling positions, but the upgraded software can handle up to eight. So then we'll be able to put the hoses on the opposite side. So we'll have, all, we'll have eight fueling positions uh, when the whole system is, is up and running. The whole goal of this was to be able to track everything from inside the office, total totalizer readings, how much fuel is in each tank. So um, in the uh, capital improvement, if we ever go to a second fueling site, everything will be able to be read from one location. You won't have to manually do stick readings or totalizer readings. So right now it's, it's working very well. And also for 17, they're going to continue to provide scheduled preventive maintenance as required and maintain the ASC certification. And that's all I have. Do you have anything else, Ed? What's the projection on when the audit will be presented to council? I talked with them today and they don't anticipate having the actual document finally approved through their system until the middle of November. So it may be. December before we actually get a presentation from them. The reason I was asking is Mrs. Thomas called the other day and said that Mr. Thomas had finished his budget reading and he was getting nervous at night, <laughs> so she wants to schedule it. Yeah. We could help you, That's have you help us you no. um, <laughs> proofread. We could always use that kind of help. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Bitter, question. Years ago, too many to think about it. But, uh, I don't remember. You don't? It was even before your time, actually. <laughs> I don't know if it's still a requirement that we had to go throughout the city and, and do a pen and pencil inventory of all equipment, computers, everything. At one time we were looking for the possibility of going to like a bars code system there it could be electronically read. Is that still a requirement or what do we do about it? Um, we don't count every single thing. Different departments do like Public safety has an inventory of the weapons. IT inventories, copiers and printers and that kind of thing. But we keep track of assets above $5,000. And we do send out a list to each department every year, twice a year, I think, and ask them to verify that they still have those things and that they're still in work and order. And all. Any other questions for finance? Thank you, Gil. Okay. Good job, Ed. Did you, uh, did you add a bicycle onto the inventory list? <laughs> <laughs> a bicycle? Who had a bicycle? We're not you, talking you. about the bicycle. <laughs> All right. I, just I asked for a Mustang. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly's going to talk now about human right. resources, Appreciate please. <clears throat> Mayor and Council, thank you for having me. I always enjoy the opportunity to tell you what we're doing in human resources and then take any questions that you might have. Um, this one? The other one. The other one that's worn off? I know, you went to FSU. It's, it's the one on the right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
We're not going to go there. I'm not going to read you our mission, but just to let you know that um, our focus is really on recruiting, retaining, and developing a diver diverse and a very high-performing workforce, and that is what our focus on. And we do that in really six primary focus areas. We focus on recruitment and selection, on talent retention, on training and development, compensation and classification, performance management, and health and wellness. Those are the broad categories. So I want to just give you some highlights of each of those six primary areas, if I may. Um, we're going to start with recruitment and selection. Uh, we actually processed over 6,630 applications, um, had 79 new hires, 36 internal transfers or promotions, and, thank, and then thanks to you, we did look at a intern program. We had two wounded warrior interns. One was in human resources and occupational safety, and the other was in uh, the water plant, actually did so well. We ended up employing them in our land treatment center. Um, and then we had one transitioning veteran, or still do, in transportation. So that program is working well. Uh, we, the next area that I wanted to focus on is in talent retention. We have a career development program we've put in place. Um, we also, uh, in, uh, just to expand on that just a little bit, our career development program, for example, in many of our departments, uh, let's just take a maintenance one, for example, in order to be a maintenance two, someone had to vacate that position. Well, we came and talked to you about a career development program, which meant if I can meet the criteria to be a maintenance worker two, shouldn't I be able then to promote? Uh, people, uh, what we looked at in our exit interview program is that people are looking at promotion and adding value and they feel a career development program was a way to do that. So we implemented a career development program. It's been very successful so far. We've done that in several departments. It, you'll see it as a goal in 2017 for expanding that into other departments. Um, we also, under talent retention, had uh, an internal talent identified for public safety. What does that mean? We worked with public services and identified several um, individuals that were interested in working in public safety and fire and police. So we had already high-performing employees that might want to look at that as a career. So we were fortunate to go into uh, uh, Streets Division Sanitation and talk to many of our uh, existing employees and see if any were interested in a career in public safety, and that worked for us. At this point, we've hired two and moved them over. So we're excited about doing that again. Um, the other uh, piece of talent retention, of course, is leadership development. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Our original, as we called them, 19, who are our alumni now. And we have a new group that's moved into our leadership development program. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about um, t training and development. Um, we also have a focus on creating a culture of inclusion. I know Dr. Woodruff has been talking to you quite a bit about that. We've worked with UNC um, in regard to the barrier analysis, and we also are participating on our diversity task force. So we're looking at 2017 and being very engaged in, in that process. We are also focusing on the next area, which is training and development. You remember when we presented this not too long ago, and this is our comprehensive model. Um, we have done HR training for supervisors. What does that mean? That just means a lot of what our supervisors have to do is human resources. Uh, typically about 80% of the work that most supervisors do is working with their people. So we want to make sure they're doing all the right things. So we went out and did training with those um, individuals. We had actually over 99 supervisors that the human resources um, staff trained on FMLA, Family Medical Leave Act, FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, and workers' compensation. We also had uh, 20 supervisors go through uh, supervisory skills training. We partnered with the community college and really crafted a program around what we wanted that to look like. We were in, the engagement from leadership was phenomenal. Dr. Woodruff and Ron Massey helped kick off those programs, so there was real buy-in from the leadership, and I think that that was important. We also had customer service skills training. We had retirement education sessions, and I was really kind of surprised at this number. Our retirement education sessions, we had over 109 people attend. So people are really looking at financial planning in, in the next few years, so that was important to know. Um, and then we implemented an online safety program. A lot of the feedback we got, particularly from public safety, uh, Mike and Arrow's group is, you know, pulling people out for that face-to-face -face training every year can be complicated. So we have moved to an online safety training program that's been fairly successful at this point. The next area 
compensation and classification. Again, we have developed a career path process. I talked to you a little bit about that earlier. Um, we're excited about that. I know the employees are excited about that. So we, uh, we want to continue that as part of our comprehensive training program. We did have new Fair Labor Stan Standards, uh, it's FLSA Fair Labor Standards Act. There were new regulations that were implemented this year. This was very interesting for us and many other, well, all employers really across the nation. Uh, there is a threshold that you have to meet to be exempt. There's exempt employees and non-exempt employees. For, for lack of bigger explanation, let's just say it's hourly and salary. In order to be salary or exempt, you have to meet a threshold. That threshold has always been 23,660. I think it hasn't changed in 20 years. So it was moved to 47,476, which is a huge jump. And that required us to do a pretty extensive assessment of our workforce and then test out a lot of our positions against some of the duties tests. So we did that this year. Um, the interesting part of that, we want to make sure, of course, we're always in compliance. The interesting part of that is that it's going to be moving every three years, and, and it looks like about 3% every three years, so that threshold will, will change. We'll keep you updated on that. More to come. Um, the other thing, of course, is our ongoing assessment of our market competitiveness. We, can, we actually participate in dozens of surveys. One of the biggest we do is the North Carolina League of Municipalities salary surveys, and then we respond to those. And then when we get those responses, we get those surveys back. We evaluate those results, and we look at where we are in every one of our positions to see how we rate. Um, so we're working on that constantly. Um, the next area is performance management. We have a performance management cycle. I'm not sure if you know this, but um, we would re redesigned that to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. In August, we do training with all of our supervisors because we want to make sure there's consistency in ratings from department to department. We um, Then the supervisor completes evaluations in September. Those evaluations, not the actual documents, but the scores are then shared with the city manager because we want to make sure there's consistency across departments. Then in October and November is when the performance discussions happen with the employees, and then those evaluations are sent back to Human Resources in November. And we try to keep a consistent process around that every year. Finally, health and wellness. Um, our health and wellness, uh, it, you know, it's interesting because it used to be called benefits administration. It's much more focused on health and wellness now because that drives our cost. Uh, we have 513 employees that are in our health benefits, just the health benefits piece, which is 969 covered lives. Um, we did this year have a lot of plan design uh, changes for to our cost structure. We, we did change our deductibles. We changed our in, in emergency room co-pays. We changed our prescription um, co-pays. Uh, so that we could be a little bit more um, competitive, and we needed to for our cost structure, as you know, we're self-insured. That did happen this year, as well as our HSA. You know, we have 40, remember the health savings account we talked about extensively? We had nine members, we've gone to 45. That was a big jump, and that really is kind of the trend. Um, I think also everyone is familiar with ACA, Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare. That required a lot of reporting. We reported for the first time. And we're proud to say we were, uh, it was submitted without any errors or penalties, that we were probably in the minority with that. So we're, we're glad that went well. Uh, and then wellness. Our wellness initiative went from 70 to 180 members this year. And I think a lot of that can be as a result of um, the working group. We created a working group for wellness that uh, is uh, represented by every department. It helps with the communication. We also started, I think, one of the, the unique uh, programs we have is called a Fitbit Activity Group. There's 147 people in the Fitbit Activity Group, and they really compete with each other. They have little groups that compete with activity. So that's been fun. Um, those are the, the six areas that I wanted to focus on that HR really has as our primary focal area. Our goals and objectives for FY17, we want to continue our comprehensive training program, which means we're going to continue to do the building leadership capacity with the new set of uh, uh, the new group. I think we're at 22. And um, 
we want to expand our career development program. We've piloted it, it is successful. We, wanted to conti we want to continue to do that so people have an opportunity to grow their knowledge, skills, and abilities. Uh, we are customizing our wellness program, as you are aware, because we talked about that and engaging Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and we have a program manager that's working with us. So part of that will be implementing education programs to improve our health benefits utilization. A lot of what that person is doing now is about education. So we're, we're hoping we can dive um, into that deeper in 2017. We have implemented NeoGov. NeoGov is a new um, applicant tracking software. Um, well, I should say applicant management software because we're not just tracking applications any longer. We can now manage the process. What we had before um, was okay, but we wanted to do something that was more comprehensive, and this follows our three E's, um, and we're excited about implementing that. Um, and we've already started the process of implementation, and it's gone fairly well. Um, and then the final thing is our culture of um, inclusion. We are looking, we're working with our uh, diversity task force and we're looking at um, what we can do differently in, in recruitment, selection, and retention as we move forward. On the NeoGov program, we put together a cross section all the way down to crew leaders to understand what were the current problems with those, you know, with recruiting and reviewing applications. So that NeoGov program was actually built from the frontline supervisor up. It wasn't something that, if you pardon the expression, the people in the glass house designed. It needs to be designed by the frontline supervisor, and that's how we did that. Very good report. Any questions on HR? Good job. Thank you. Let's have one more, and then we'll take a short break. Can we do this in five minutes, Mike? I doubt it. Public safety. First thing I'd like to point out is that the chief is wearing a white shirt tonight. That's right. Mayor Council, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about public safety. Um, basically, this is our mission statement, and it boils down to what is uh, is to provide great public safety. Make sure that we're providing this for our safe community. Um, just a little bit about the Department of Public Safety, the fire services. We have 88 budgeted positions. Police services, we have 166 uh, budgeted positions. We answered 132,000 calls, police calls for service. That's a 17% increase over last year. Fire, we, we answered 42,415 fire calls for service. Our 911 center answered 134,000 calls for service. 99.53% of those 911 calls were answered in 10 seconds uh, or three rings, which is the industry standard. Um, and, and I think the, uh, one of the things that's important is we usually don't talk about uh, the telecommunicators, but that's the first line, the first entry point to the public safety system. And answering those calls in, in less than 10 seconds or three rings is very important to get a first responder to the scene. And what we've done over the last several years, and we'll talk a little bit about that, is that we've focused on getting a first responder, whether it's, a, whether it's from a firefighter or a police officer, getting those first responders to the scene as quickly as we can. Our average response time from 2011 to 2016 uh, for police services has dropped 12 percent. Emergence, uh, average response time for fire is 4.50 uh, minutes. Our investigator... Let, let, let's say that that didn't come across as 4.50 minutes. 4.50. 4, you meant 4, 4 minutes and, and 50, 50, 50 seconds. seconds. Okay. That's a lot better response. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to get it done in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now you're on an average of 4.50. <laughs> oh, 4.50, okay. Uh, our investigative division cleared uh, or had 7,605 cases. We cleared 5,500 of those. We had 16 people named in federal indictments. And I think that's been some of our success in, in reducing violent crime in our communities. We've used the federal system to, um, to indict people for serious crimes, uh, either the gun or drug-related, serious drug-related or, or gun crimes. So um, 16 is, is quite a few, 
And the difference in the federal and the state system is, in the federal system, if you get a year, you serve 365 days. So there's, there, there is a benefit to using the federal system, and we've been very successful in that uh, over the last several years. We have four fire stations, and they performed 231 child safety seat checks. We did 1,700 uh, fire inspections, 56 in the ETJ. Um, fire and Emergency Service answered 3,775 uh, emergency calls. 61% of those were EMS related. Some of our accomplishments, um, uh, National Night Out, we had about 10,000 even though it rained later in the event, we still had a, a good showing. And our third annual Running with the Law, we had 224 uh, participants. The money for that goes to uh, Special Olympics and they are very appreciative of that. So it was a very successful event again this year. And that's up uh, year one, I believe we had a little less than 60 runners. Right. And to see that come in three years up to that large amount and the amount of money that was raised is quite a compliment to the department. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the country about, uh, about police services and we've seen things in Ferguson and even in Charlotte just recently. And, and I think uh, overall, one of the things that we've been working toward is how can we reduce use of force, use of force in our community and, and address some of the needs. 50% of, uh, of all use of, of, of all uh, use of deadly force are people that are mentally challenged. So we looked at that and, and we've been working toward that. Obviously we added the police crisis counselor, we appreciate that. Uh, we've trained about 60 of our first responders in crisis intervention training and that's all to address our communities mental mentally challenged individuals and I think I think that's been very successful in the reduction of use of force we had about a 17 percent uh, reduction in use of force um, incidents over the last three years and I think a lot of it is is how we've trained our police officers and the implementation we have 98 patrol officers our goal is to train all 98 in crisis intervention training because it has a de-escalation piece in it that, uh, that is very, uh, very effective and very efficient. And um, we think that that's going to, to improve or, or actually reduce the amount of use of, uses of force we have. The other thing, we've had a 32% drop over the last three years in police complaints, citizen police complaints. And I think a lot of that is how we talk. Uh, there's uh, a story I'll tell you. I got a phone call from an individual whose son was uh, schizophrenic and actually ran from, from him when he was taken to an appointment uh, near Onslow Memorial Hospital. And um, he ran into a, a, into a restaurant, locked the door, wouldn't come out. And then he ran out of that door and into the, into the grocery store close to there, food line, and um, was scaring people. Well, the officers arrived, the crisis counselor arrived, they were able to de-escalate the situation, get him to, to the appropriate treatment, and it was a very effective way. And, and the, the father called and said how appreciative he was of the patience of the police officers and our crisis counselor. And I think those are things that, uh, just that story, um, we answered around 900 calls last year where people were mentally challenged. Uh, we, we, um, we, intervened in about a hundred or three hundred uh, involuntary commitments last year. So this continues to be a challenge for us. One of the things I think that um, working with with uh, um, with you all, we, we had this discussion and that and we've been moving forward about some type of treatment center here in our community, a residential treatment center, where we can bring bring folks like that that need treatment and they can be uh, given the proper treatment. You know, right now we have, we have a little choice. We can either take them to jail or we can take them to the emergency room. Um, both places are not appropriate for, for these mentally challenged individuals. So we're going to continue to work on this over the next several years. <clears throat> life saved, I think this is, we had seven lives saved this year. 
that's 18 saved since 2012 when you gave us permission to uh, to increase the way or change the way that we responded to medical emergencies so I think this program has been very successful and it, it permeates throughout the organization like I said the 90 95.3 percent answered within three rings or 10 seconds or 10 yeah 10 seconds that's that's that goes toward getting that first responder on the scene as quickly as we can and 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 this is just uh, um, this is just the results of, of throughout our organization if an officer is writing a ticket and he hears the uh, heart attack call come out or it's somebody's lucky day they get they get to go and the officer responds so um, the firefighters we, we look at how long it takes them to uh, get their gear on and get out of that building and get to those those calls as quickly as we as as possible and we've been very successful not only in in those medical emergencies that we're talking about but the Narcan administration we we have every first responder carries Narcan now and the Narcan is a uh, um, is used for people with opiate uh, overdoses since January we've administered 11 doses to eight different patients and those patients most likely would have died had they not been administered that so every first responder carries it and they respond to it they've used it and it's it's been very effective because of the heroin is that the one that you use up the nose? yes it is so um, so we have dose every officer carries them it's a it's a spray up the nose and it it it's an antagonist to uh, to opiates or opioids <clears throat> the fair and impartial policing the uh, diversity and inclusion that we've been working on with HR and uh, and other city departments every police officer in the department went through fair and impartial policing fair and impartial policing is a class that basically discusses people's biases everybody has biases but how do we how do we address those biases and how do we um, how do we police as fair and impartially as we can so there's classes for supervisors there's classes for police officers every officer went through the department and we, we got a lot of good comments it was it was good training just to talk about just to to bring up about about biases that individual people have and how do we address those and how do we be as fair as possible as we're policing the fire academy uh, we started that several years ago uh, that's a partnership with coastal carolina community college it gives us a ready pool uh, we've we've got some volunteers in it as well it's a ready pool that we could um, that we can use to improve our diversity uh, within within the Department of Public Safety the Public Safety Explorers program we're partnering with Sandy Run Baptist Church that program is to get young people in, involved in public safety we've got uh, we've got several in several in the class right now and we think that uh, we need to encourage our young people to think as public safety as a option for a career option <clears throat> citizen engagement um, we did the church safety seminar the coffee with a cop has been very very popular our dog walkers program which is uh, like a community watch program that we're in fire and our fire prevention efforts again I think part of our community engagement we've actually seen like I said a 32 percent drop in in citizen complaints and I think a lot of it is because of that citizen engagement that we're uh, that we're engaged in our computer forensic examiner uh, because more and more crimes are are related to computers cell phones um, we have a, we've sent somebody to the National Computer Forensic Institute uh, the Secret Service sponsored us they provided us all the equipment and we we do forensic examinations not just for the city but uh, the county and the other small municipalities in our area um, and it might be anything from a cell phone looking at the information on a cell phone to looking at the information in computers to uh, looking online for predators that are online so um, that computer forensic investigator 
went to several months of school in order to learn how to do that, and he's very, very effective in his, in his position. Our goals and objectives. One is to reduce crime by, by uh, and I think that, you know, I've talked to you about being proactive, and we can, we can, we uh, continue to discuss that with our police officers. We're using the crime mapping program so we can target key areas within the city where crime occurs and trying to reduce crime in those particular areas. So we're going to continue to do that as one of our goals. Our goal is to, to reduce crime as much as possible, and we're continuing to look at the trends, the crime trends, what we have, and how we can reduce those. Decrease force by, by the officers. I think, you know, we've talked about that 17%, but we can still do better. We, we are working right now. Uh, our accreditation manager has been working on changing um, our use of force policy to look at de-escalation, to look at a, a goal of the sanctity of life in, in the use of force. Uh, that's going to require us to change the way that we do, to do business, and it's going to take some time. So we're working on that. We're working on a training program that's going to, that's going to refocus the way we train people in use of force in a, in a hope to even reduce those, those um, um, uses of force that we have now as much as we can. And I think we're still, our, our goal is to still develop some kind of method to uh, deal with mentally challenged individuals in our community. I think it's, I think it's a serious problem in our community um, and we need to continue to, to work on that and to see what we can do. The CIT training is just one piece. Uh, the crisis counselor is just one, one piece. But uh, we have to continue to look at, at ways and things that we can do to address this challenge in our, in our community. <clears throat> I think uh, we're, we're looking at an ISO inspection this year. We're also, uh, we're also continuing to work on accreditation for fire. We just finished the, uh, the, our police on site. And we are, our communications division is, is in the accreditation process. So we think those make us more effective and more efficient, and we'll continue on those processes. You might mention what an ISO inspection is. Spencer, <laughs> let me let you. That's the, the North Carolina Office of State Fire Marshal comes in and inspects the fire department, basically gives it a, a report card grade, and that grade affects the homeowners, the fire insurance premiums for homeowners and business owners in the city. It has a, has a direct also, impact on that. <laughs> Also evaluates other things too, the alarm systems, water supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole process the, by evaluating the fire department, they're looking at three primary things. One is the communication okay. system, one is the water supply system, and the other is the fire department equipment, personnel, and training. And where are we at on the uh, body cameras? That's a that's an interesting. Has that question. changed since the new law took effect in October? By well. Uh, the body cameras, now of course we, we are in the process right now, and we took some grant money actually in replacing our in-car camera systems. Right. And in-car camera systems are, are um, they're probably 10 years old, and it's time to replace those. A lot, a lot of changes in technology, a lot of changes in, in the, the system itself, you know, um, going to an HD which makes things a lot clearer so we're working on that process the the body cams we still <coughs> part of the issue is going to be the storage of that data um, an officer that's wearing a body cam the body cams that we would purchase is going to use one gig of data per day per shift so when you take 98 patrol officers and you put that on there it's going to be um, it's going to be rather expensive. Charlotte spent one million dollars on the cameras. They spend two million dollars a year on the storage for that data. But I thought that new law was uh, sort of indicated that <coughs> non-controversial tape wouldn't have to be stored. Uh, according to the records yeah, retention law, to keep it has to it has to stay for a set period of time. Even though it, even though it's not available to the public. That's true. That's Has that true. been worked out yet as far as the hard and fast rules as far as retention? 
or is that still up in the air? Well, retention is by the state of North Carolina, 30 <coughs> days. So an officer who has a body cam on has to keep that data for 30 days. So have you calculated the total amount of data that you're, you're saving over that 30-day period before you can purge? And that's not even counting if you have a case that well, has to be put in reserve. The, right? the, there's two issues. The first issue is that we're already retaining quite a bit of data with the in-car cameras. Most of our incidents occur outside the car, and they are being, they are being videotaped by those, um, by those in-car cameras. So we would not, and, and part of the issue is you can't eliminate those in-car cameras. So that is taking a tremendous amount of storage space now. So in order for us to implement the body cams, we'd have to virtually double our storage space, which is going to be rather expensive, and we would have to keep that data for 30 days. The state law really didn't uh, um, talk about data retention. Okay. All it talked about was the ability to release that data. Okay, It gives the police chief uh, some option to allow people to see the data, not to release it. The only way that it can be released is by a judge's order. Let me comment on this. I have, several weeks ago, we had a meeting with Ernie Lee and with the chief and with the city attorney, and we talked about the new state law. One of the things that we decided is that we're going to have a workshop, your next workshop, November the 9th. We are going to have Ernie Lee and the city attorney and the chief give you an overview of our current protocols and how those, co how those protocols are impacted by the new law that, w that goes into effect. It went into effect. It went into effect. Into okay. Into and so I think that, that you, will, you will appreciate the workshop of November the 9th. More importantly, though, we feel it's important to get out to the public what the new rules are. People need to understand what the rules of releasing this information, what those rules are before you have an incident. If you go back and look nationwide at the instances, there have been different responses in the community based upon the release of information. And people want to know why is it that in Tulsa they did it this way, but in Charlotte they did it that way. Part of it was human decisions, but the vast majority of it was legal requirements. So what we want to do on November the 9th is to give you and the public a good workshop that explains the new law, how we are required to implement that new law. So we look forward to doing that at the next session. Different states have different requirements and you know some states that have very uh, open um, records records uh, laws have actually discontinued using the, the cameras because of the number of requests that they have, have gotten so this bill was supposed to balance those things um, there's some good things and there's some things that uh, that probably should be changed and probably will be changed as 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 the as we move forward on this just an observation, your Narcan, what, 11 administrations to 8 individuals? If the person is not conscious, how is the determination made to administer it? In, with, with Narcan, there's no, there's, no, there's no contraindication. So you can give Narcan. If somebody's unconscious, a lot of times we will give it. And it's interesting that you, that you picked up on that because, you know, we've gone to, to a particular house administered Narcan, it's, it's revived the person, they've gone to the emergency room, and then we've gone back there several days later and administered it again. So, um, you know, the, the drugs that they're mixing with, fentanyl and other, other opioids, I've got to make sure I say that word right, opioids, um, are, very, are very, very potent, and it, it just depends. Even heroin you know, heroin comes in different concentrations. So somebody t that's taking heroin today might think, well, you know, I'm taking this much, and they end up overdosing, and they end up basically just stop breathing. So it's, it's a serious issue in our community, 
it's a serious issue uh, nationwide. N Jacksonville was uh, rated number 12th for opioid um, abuse in the country. Um, Fayetteville is right above us. Wilmington was number one. So uh, this East, Eastern North Carolina has has some challenges uh, as far as heroin is concerned. And I think some of those indictments that we talked about, those 16 federal indictments, had to do with uh, heroin. Well, it's a lot better system of, of dealing with op opium overdoses than the old-fashioned way of, of the adrenaline injection into the heart. So and that would be, you could have some really serious contraindications, you know, with that. And that's good that we have that. How about the AEDs? Are we still we still have those? In the those yeah, the AEDs. The AEDs go. Uh, um, you know, we implemented that program several years ago. That's that's the reason that we have as many saves as we have. Um, that's been a very effective program, and uh, I think that uh, that it'll continue. Every emergency vehicle that we have has an AED in it. I think that's probably one of the best moves we've made is to, to have those. In and, and I think that, you know, um, working on the response time for those emergency calls and, you know, I, I, I actually had some reservations that the officers wouldn't like, you know, if you're writing a ticket, you just put, you know, you leave. Uh, and they, they are very, um, very adamant that they, they think that this is the right thing for them to do. So if they're talking to somebody about a dog, uh, a dog running loose, and they hear the heart attack call down the street, they're going to respond. They're going to tell that person, hey, we'll, we'll come back. We'll take care of your barking dog call, but we're going to respond over here first. And I think that's been very effective for us. Plus, I think the closer relationship between police officers and firefighters and their working together on those EMS calls has been has been very effective in the in moving the treatment forward as as they respond to these calls. Chief, we're at the four minute, 50 second mark. <laughs> well, I only have one more slide. And, and that's uh, develop a career succession program. And in fact, this week we're doing leadership in police organization and public safety organizations, which teaches, uh, teaches our, our first responders the most effective way of, of managing uh, emergency providers. That class is a three-week class. It was developed by the IICP with the Department of Navy, or to, excuse me, Department of Army, and uh, so it's it's a it's a good program. Um, we're we're also still involved in the EFO and the FBI Academy and the the National Fire Academy in training <coughs> our folks so that they can be as uh, they can go to those state of the art schools. And I think the, the last one, you know, we've, we've talked about the station alerting system, which gets those calls out a lot quicker. We're looking at a power phone. It's called power phone or um, a way to ask certain questions and to streamline the process of questions that we ask to, to in, in our dispatching process to even speed that three minutes up as quickly as we can so we can get vital information to those first responders. So those are some things that we're going to be working on. The CAD to CAD system that we're, we've been discussing with the uh, with um, Camp Lejeune for for quite a while. We're still working on that process. We've been working with them on our uh, on our emergency buttons. You know, for the firefighters, when especially since um, we're responding to their fires, they're responding to our fires, and we're working as one team. So. The 800 system has allowed us to um, to work more effectively together, and we're going to continue to work on that. So, have you had any cases of uh, how the interoperability works? Like oh, the gate? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've had we've had a lot of cases where the interoperability with the base has been very effective, especially in the fire ground. You know, because they're they're there, um, and even even with the police, we've been able to communicate much better uh, on certain incidents. I know, I mean, years past, you know, you had the gate out there, you had people fleeing from c crimes that may have been committed to get on the base, but by the time you communicated with the base, you know, they were safe back in the barracks, probably fast asleep. You know, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's been very effective and, and more efficient for us. 
And I, and I think, you know, part of that, you know, we've t we didn't really talk about the domestic violence issues that we've been working on. And part of our, part of our work has been the partnership that we have with Camp Lejeune where we call and, and they have a cooling off period on any domestic violence. But the radio system has helped us do that because, you know, we, we from the scene, we can call PMO and say, hey, look, this, this military person is here. We need to, uh, to have some discussions. And, you know, we've had very few um, serious domestic-related inju uh, injuries because of that, uh, that partnership we have with them. How long have you been here now? Twelve years. Twelve years. And this is a graying hair type job. It's still black. Are you using hair color? <laughs> Wait a minute. What, what, what's this? <laughs> when I came here, I had no gray hair. <laughs> We're getting a little personal now, aren't we? <laughs> Just stating the facts. Before we open up to questions, I would like to take a moment to personally commend Spencer. Every time we have any type of um, hurricane event, he is the one who really leads the EOC. Now, while we didn't activate the EOC, because we didn't think the storm was to the degree that was necessary. Uh, he is the one who led that effort, and I personally want to thank him. Well done. Thanks, sir. Good job. Good job. Questions that you might have, police and fire, public safety. If it's acceptable, let's take a five-minute break. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. We're back in session. Uh, Dr. Woodruff, do you have anything else to present tonight? There are no other business items on your workshop. The G10 staff did inform me that at the beginning of the session, that while you were live, there was no audio. There was a request by the county to add an additional item to your workshop agenda. That item had to do with an EOC expansion and a lease amendment. Council took no action on that and did not place that on the agenda. Therefore, that was not discussed this evening. Beyond that, we have a city council meeting at 7. Thank you for your attendance this evening. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.